Uh, I would like to uh, tell my happiness to meet you as we are sharing the word of God uh, today. We are going to touch about a somewhat common subject which may not be common as it were. Why? Because the word of God is new every morning as his grace is. So we are going to touch about um, the sanctuary message. Uh, this is a beautiful message. It's a summary of the Bible put wisely by God himself, the unerring and sovereign Lord. He put this one so that we can understand easily. The sanctuary message is also interesting in this uh, area, that it can be used as a barometer or a testing standard by which we can measure all doctrines that come our, our way. A doctrine cannot be correct by uh, its sweetness to ears, but you can measure it by the word of God. And the sanctuary message can also be used to measure um, the truthfulness of uh, every doctrine that comes our way. <coughs> as you shall see as we delve into the sanctuary message. Now, let's ask David, the friend of God, the friend of Jesus. If you want to know more about a person, you ask his friend. David has something to tell us about how God moves. Psalms 77, verse 13, it says here, uh, Thy ways, O God, are in the sanctuary. That's David for you. He knows how God moves about. If you go into the sanctuary, you turn your head. To the left, you see Jesus. To the right, you see Jesus. Everywhere and everything in and about the sanctuary is Christ. Save for one seemingly a uh, gate crusher object which is the ten commandments and we will tell each other why it's placed there where jesus is this script is also there and this will also justify my earlier statement where i said it's used to justify or to measure the truthfulness of all doctrines that can may come our way okay uh we ask david again psalms 84 uh verse number 10 I'm interested so much in, uh, in this uh, verse I read in your audience. Um, for a day in your courts or in the sanctuary is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper at your house um, than dwell in the tents of the wickedness. You know, David, with this statement, we check qualification. He qualifies. I don't qualify to say this statement because I have never stayed at the state house. Now, David is saying you would rather be a doorkeeper or a guard, Mahobo, so to say, at the church, at the sanctuary, than to be a somebody at the state house. You know, you need to take this one seriously, because this is a great patriarch, a friend of God, after all. He is, is lamenting to be a very lowly person at the church, at the sanctuary, okay? But the sanctuary physically was something which would stink from afar, okay? The waste of animals which were being slaughtered there, the blood, it was stinking, but David is saying it's better to be there. Why? Because turning all around, left, right, front, back, you are seeing objects of Christ. Christ is being represented by everything that was put there magnificently, in a wise way, put by the, by the unerring Lord. Okay? Now, we don't waste a lot of our time. We start to touch object by object of the sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary was a rectangular um, structure which faced to the east, okay? It had a door which was said to be 9.1 meters wide. Yes, you heard me well, 9.1 meters wide. Have you ever made such a door at any building? This was too big, but it did a purpose. It will make you um, remember of this verse, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, oh, who are heavy laden. Everyone must get in. No stampede. We will get in there freely, all of us. Even if you are spiritually obsessed by sin, I think you will still get in. Jesus is saying, come unto me. Uh, what is the secret of the door? Like I said earlier on, that um, we can also measure the truthfulness of all the doctrines that come, to, uh, that, that come our way uh, as brethren. Some people, uh, if this uh, saying, which they normally say, um, Doctrine uh, can vary, but we go to the same God. Just like uh, the structure of a roof. Okay? But now, we go to John chapter 10, verse um, uh, number 1. Uh, Jesus says here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He who 
does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, the same is a thief. So we have got one way, just like the sanctuary had one door. There are no several ways of worshipping. We need to check which is the way. And there's only one way we can check, by means of the scriptures. Okay, that, that very same chapter, uh, verse number 9, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. In other words, you can choose. After all, the primary and fundamental gift given to men on creation was the gift of choice. You can choose to enter by another gate, but here you are guaranteed that you are not going to be saved. Christ is the door of the sanctuary. Okay? We don't need to make our own doors. So we throw away that notion, that philosophy, that doctrine which says we can, you know, we, you can use your way to worship, I use my way, he uses his way. There is only one way into the sanctuary and this way is Christ Jesus. And it's, it's wide open for everyone to get in. It's wide open for everyone. Even those who are spiritually obese with sin, they can move in so easily. He is saying, come unto me. The invitation is open. Everyone is being invited. So let's decide to go to Christ. Let's decide to use this door. Let's not climb by another way. John chapter 16 says, He who enters into the sheepfold by another way, which is not the door, the same is a thief. Stealing is a sin, forbidden outrightly and expressly on the Ten Commandments. Please don't use another door. We have got a door which is called Christ. Okay? But observable, observable from afar is the rectangular um, demarcation or the jura or, or the wall, so to say. Okay? Let's learn about the wall. How can it be Christ? We go to Job. Uh, let's open our Bibles to Job uh, chapter 24, verse number 2. Job chapter 24, verse number 2. And uh, we will read together. Um, sorry. Job 24, verse uh, 2. It says here, uh, Some remove the landmarks. They violently take away flocks and feed thereof. Okay? Now, this has been the tactic of the devil since time immemorial. To shift the boundaries so that we come out of the safety of Christ. This marking is saying, stay inside. Don't go outside. Now, what does the devil do? He come and deceive us. That outside there is joy. He shifts the boundary. He shifts the landmark. He removes that wall and we go outside in pursuit of joy. What comes to one's mind? Luke 15, the prodigal son. He thinks at home there is no joy. He goes out away from the father. But I like uh, verse number 17 of the same chapter. It says when he came back to his senses, okay, listening is a skill. What does it imply? When he thought of going away from home, it implies that he was out of his senses. Brethren, pastors only look greener from afar the time you get there you look back wherever you are standing is actually greener than where you are let's stay in the safety of christ let's stay within the walls this is why we have got more than a dozen verses which stress about the boundaries in the bible i will also read another one that's deuteronomy chapter 27 verse number 17 um deuteronomy 27 verse 17 I will read in your audience again. It says here, Blessed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say Amen. You know, elders would stand before the church to pronounce a case which would be confirmed by the church just for shifting the boundaries. Because the boundaries were necessary. They meant that we are playing within. Even in soccer, we love soccer. Many of our brethren, the men, we love soccer. Any good skill that is done outside the peripherals of the stadium, they count to nothing. Whatever you do, it must be within the peripherals. So, this jural or this wall 
of the sanctuary is Christ in, him, in himself. He, we must stay within him. No true joy outside of Christ. Uh, if I may, I may be allowed to quote the de desire of ages, the preface, paraphrased, it says, any man at every stage of life is always longing for something that is, he, that is better than he now possesses. This desire was blended by God himself in every man's heart so that no one and no one will ever rest outside of Christ. This is true, uh, brethren. I can have a lot of uh, biblical uh, citations. We have got great men in the world, the billionaires that we know, but they will never say a statement that was said by a very simple man. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 29, Simeon, when he looked at the face of baby Jesus, he says, Lord, even if I may rest, I will rest in peace. In other words, you are saying, Lord, even if I die, there's no problem. Billionaires will never say this. They wanted, to, if they, their money could be used to buy life, they would buy it again. Because there's no satisfaction in money. It's only in Jesus. So let's stay in Jesus. Let's stay within the wall, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, as soon as you entered the third object, as, you, as soon as you entered the sanctuary, to the right, at the corner, there was uh, an altar of burnt offering. Okay? This structure was uh, rectangular in shape. It was an altar. So it was uh, a little bit up. Uh, it had two layers. One layer for bronze and the other one for wood. Which was a symbolic of Christ. Whereby divinity will be uh, living together with humanity. It had four horns on its corners. Horns, even on a cow, all animals that have got horns, they are used for defense. Okay, this is why even if af after murdering someone outside of the sanctuary, if you had to run into the sanctuary successfully without being caught, whatever sin you had done, if you would run into the sanctuary and hold two horns, you are already acquitted. No one is allowed to punish you anymore. What does this uh, make us think of? Exactly. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation, condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ is our refuge. We don't have safety anywhere else. He is the only one who has got the right and absolute right to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Romans chapter 8, verse 33 says, Who can lay charge to the elect? No one can be able to accuse us. After all, he himself, Jesus, failed to accuse even the one who was found guilty, the lady who was found in the very act. He failed. It's not his business to accuse people, but to save those who are accused. That's Christ for us. Now, this altar of bent offering is where um, we would, as sinners, we would enter into the sanctuary uh, with our offering object, be it a lamp, Tattle doves or whatever, and we would place our hand on top of it. The innocent and uh, an animal without blemish representing Christ we would then say our sins, transferring them from us to that animal, and you would slaughter it by yourself. So that by chance you feel pity that I'm killing something innocent, as Christ would come and die for us. Um, you would come as you are, say your sins. And you would be justified. Now, as I said on in my introduction, that this structure was laid out with absolute wisdom. At the entrance here, it represents Genesis. Before falling, and then just at the entrance, man falls. Exodus now is this burnt offering um, area, whereby it's saying, everyone come, remember in Egypt what happened. Even if you were stealing yesterday, or you were in the house of a, of a concubine the day before, it just needed you to come into, the, into a house where the door was sprinkled uh, with blood. It didn't matter what you did yesterday. The moment you got into that house, you are saved. It makes us think of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. When you are in Christ Jesus, you are now a new creature. There's no one who can be able to blame you. No one can be justified to blame you or to accuse you, so to say. But this is justification stage, as we said. 
Now, something pops up into one's mind. Is it enough? The other is symbol. It comes out as a question again. Were all those who were saved in Egypt successful into lending into Canaan? No. Where did they fail? They succeeded on justification, but they failed on sanctification. God chose deliberately a 40-year route where there was supposed to be eight days. Because sanctification is a process. Where a fellowship, there is a fundamental belief that is called growing in Christ. As parents, who would be happy to have a baby who will remain at one developmental stage for the rest of life? Surely God is also not happy with the philosophy that Christ loves me as I am. No development whatsoever. No growth in Christianity. It's not like that. We are called with our sins. We go to the altar of burnt offering. We say our sins. We are justified. But we are expected to grow from there. Just like the priest would not end there. He would then move towards the holy place. But before he goes to the holy place, there is this object which he meets, which is called the lava basin. It was a huge basin which contained water in it and it was quite reflective from the inside. It was made by uh, bronze uh, which was received from the donations of women in the wilderness. They took their jewelry off. They sacrificed their beauty for the glory of the gospel. Women have always had a place in evangelism. If we confuse our place, we will fight the plan of God. It will come up in the Acts of the Apostles on Dokas. Charity work, sacrificial work. Okay. They donated their jewelry. And this uh, was made. They sacrificed. I wonder if you are still able to do that these days. Sacrificing our beauty. It's so simple. You can check your SL versus your Bible. Okay? Your donations towards the cause and that which you buy for yourself. The women of those days, they sacrificed their beauty for the sake of the gospel. Because this sanctuary was supposed to preach the gospel to all the nations by virtue of having these objects in place. Now, the priest, when he got to this lava basin, he wanted to wash his hands. They probably have some dung for the uh, slaughtered animal, the blood. He would look into the basin. He would see himself in the reflective mirror. Oh, how dirty. Oh, how filthy. How does then be this become Jesus Christ? If you look yourself into Christ, you abhor yourself. If you go to Isaiah, Pastor Isaiah, Chapter 5, 6 to 7 verses, verse number 8, verse number 11, verse number 18, verse number 20. He is saying, woe unto others. Remember, this is a pastor, a great prophet. Woe unto others, woe unto others. And those who were very correct, those who say good is bad and bad is good, light is darkness and light, darkness is light. He was saying, woe unto them, preaching unto others and forgetting yourself. Tell you what, this only shows that Isaiah had not seen God yet. Because on the very next chapter, when he attended the funeral of the king of Uzea, he saw God enthroned up yonder. And verse number 5, upon seeing God, he says, Who unto me? This is a characteristic of a person who has just seen God. You don't see the blemishes of other people. You see yourself as the first candidate who need to be washed by Christ. If you look yourself into this basin, you will know that the first person who needs help is you. It's not the next, it's not the next person. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Let loneliness of mind, let each esteem others as better than self. There are wars in, board, uh, in the boards of the church. Panels of elders trying to eclipse each other. But I want to tell you, that only shows that we haven't met Christ. The moment we meet Christ, we will see others as better than ourselves. And we will see others, we will see ourselves as chief of sinners. 
First Timothy 1 verse 15. This is a faithful statement. Word of universal acceptation. That Christ Jesus came on earth to save sinners. I like the, the statement after the comma. He says, Paul, of whom I am chief. If everyone of us says I am the chief sinner, we have the best fellowship ever. We also have Brother Job. Described as, described as one who escaped evil. Okay, upright, righteous. Okay? Look at him when he saw God from chapter 38. He says, oh, I had only heard about you. I was practicing religion. But today I have seen you and I abhor myself. I hate myself. As upright as he was, he had not yet seen God. The moment you look into this lava basin, which is Christ, you see that I am found wanting. I must be spruced up and be like Christ. We also have uh, John, the beloved. He was once John the fighter, the son of thunder. If you read Acts of the Apostles commentary, chapter 53 and chapter 55. Chapter 53 is called John the beloved. Chapter 55, transformed by grace. How did he tend to be a from a fighter to become a man of love? His gospel is full of love. Those things which are never recorded by others, they are recorded by John. Acts of love, the forgiveness of a woman caught in the act, recorded by John. He is just saying love each other. If you don't love each other, people will not see that you are disciples. If you hate your brother and say you love God, you are a liar. Changing from a man of violence to a man of love. The commentator there, one writer that I like so much, called Ellen White, says he was transformed by grace. Every time he did his acts of violence, when Christ rebuked him, he would accept and he would feel sorry and wish to be like Christ. And truly, the Holy Spirit granted that wish. For example, in Luke chapter 9, when he requested that they may be given the power to call fire from heaven so that the Samaritans could be consumed for having turned a cold shoulder to Jesus, Jesus rebuked him and he accepted that rebuke. He, he was never comparing, John was never comparing himself with the next disciple. He was always checking himself against Christ, which is the business and the primary business of all who want to be like Christ. So much so that at the end of the day, we will echo the sentiments of Paul on Galatians 2 verse 20 when he says, It's no longer I who is living, but Christ is living in me. But not when you look into this mirror. You will not want to remain the same again. You will see that I am the most uh, filthy person. I am the one who needs help most, even more than those who I was thinking they need help. This was the lava basin. It's Christ. You reflect yourself and you see truly the character of yourself. Many of us, we, are, we have got hidden characters. We are geographical repentees, economic repentees. Our situation has changed a little bit. We run away from Christ. And Christ knows that. You need to look at yourself and tell, tell yourself the truth. John 8 verse 32 you shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So brethren, we are at uh, the lava basin. And these objects that I have said so far, they were all in the outer court. Which is the stage of justification. If you were to classify the stages as we go into the sanctuary. We will then move into the next Compartment, which was the, uh, the holy place. But today, I think we need to end here and uh, book a date uh, for progress uh, next time, as we will be allow allowed by the time and uh, the organizers of the program. Uh, may God richly bless the, uh, the reading of his word.